I can't stop thinking about malignant. Seriously, it's like an illness or something. I'll be going about my day and I'll just think, man, malignant was so good, so perfect, so insane. I cannot believe how good that movie was. I need to just stand here for a minute and just think about Malignant. And then I'll just be standing there at a crosswalk for four hours holding up traffic. So I need to get it out. I need to cut out the cancer. Malignant, written by Kayla Cooper and directed by James Wan, was released in September 2021 under Warner Brothers Pictures and saw a simultaneous digital release on HBO Max at the same time. The film follows Madison Mitchell as she copes with the aftermath of the death of her unborn child and her abusive husband and begins to have gruesome visions of people being murdered only to realise her visions are happening in real life and getting closer to her. Though Malignant only grossed $34 million against a budget of $40 million, a possible side effect of a release amidst the pandemic, it received generally positive reviews that praised it for being a unique and creative, if slightly outlandish, new work with plenty of franchise potential. Even without digging into the meat of the film, and believe me, there is some real meat here, Malignant replicates some pretty pivotal renditions of horror and horror theory. One has cited a number of influences for Malignant, from the 1980s body horror movement, the works of Mario Bava and Brian De Palma, to the simple pleasures of walking down the horror section of a VHS store. For those reasons, and a myriad of others, Malignant just feels like it was a horror movie made for horror fans, even without James Wan's assertion that it was exactly that. In an interview prior to the film's release, Wan said, I knew the general public probably have no idea what the heck this is, but I knew Knew that immediately there'd be a group of people that would go, we know exactly what this movie is going to be about. And it's that part of all of this that makes it really cool for me. I'm one of these people in that small group of people and I'm sharing it with friends, if you will. As I often discuss on this channel, horror has always been a genre that is significantly defined by its fans and by people who engage with it, perhaps more so than any other genre. Hell, we have multiple movies specifically about horror fans engaging with horror media. And I can't even count the amount of times a horror savvy character has been included in a movie as an audience stand-in. Even before we start discussing the film, it's interesting to consider that Malignant doesn't have any kind of audience stand-in, or anyone who knows anything about what is happening. Unlike in one's Conjuring films, where plot points are explained through Ed and Lorraine Warren, and the Insidious films through Elise Rayner. I think that this distinguishes the film as particularly unique, precluding any kind of meta-narrative in an era of horror so defined by meta-speculations about the horror genre though that does mean it's also distinguished as particularly difficult to sell to a non-horror savvy audience. Though one statement was certainly a nice thing to say to the audience that built up his career since the beginning, I also think that it's a representative of just how important audience engagement can be from a production perspective. This is similarly demonstrated in the direct fan appeal from horror TV spin-offs, Ash vs. the Evil Dead and the Child's Play series, and in the number of film tie-ins included in Universal's Halloween Horror Nights. Because while there isn't a beloved IP for fans to buy into with Malignant. One himself is such a name in the horror community and such a vocal lover and advocate for the genre that we can't help but buy into whatever he's selling. It's like the nicest rendition of capitalism we have, I guess. Going back to one's influences though, one of the more specific influences he cites is the Italian giallo horror genre and the works of giallo filmmaker Dario Argento. The term giallo, or literally yellow, derives from a series of crime mystery pulp novels novels entitled Il Giallo Mondadori, Mondadori Yellow, published by Mondadori from 1929 and taking its name from their trademark yellow cover backgrounds. The films consisted almost exclusively of Italian translations of mystery novels by British and American writers, including Agatha Christie, Ellery Queen, Edgar Allan Poe and Raymond Chandler. Returning back to cinema, evidence particularly in Argento's films Tanabre, Phenomena and Trauma, giallo as a horror genre is often characterised by its recognisable aesthetics, bright colours, opera gloves, gleaming weapons and brutal bloody violence. These cinematic hybrids of crime, horror and detection, writes Canass, are characterised by elaborate set-piece murders, lurid aesthetics and experimental soundtracks. Canass continues that giallo films symptomatically display the aesthetic self-consciousness, stylistic fragmentation and questions of representation that signify the critically reflexive relationship with tradition that defines modernism. 
When you consider the aesthetic signifiers of Giallo and compare them to Malignant's own represented aesthetic, its influence is quite clear. Indeed, the garish colours, the gleaming weapons, the brutal bloody violence are all represented throughout Malignant. Similarly, much like other Giallo films, Malignant plays out as more of a frantic whodunit or detective movie than a slasher film at times. This is especially interesting when one of the main authors Mondadori originally translated was Agatha Christie, who pioneered the whodunit genre of literature. Her book, And Then There Was None, could even be argued to have pioneered the slasher genre as we know it today, as we are presented with a cast of unlikable characters slowly being killed off by an unidentified slasher. And even the gloves, a prototypical article worn by giallo killers, are an important facet of Malignant's own mysterious killer. But more on that later. Much of the aesthetic intensity of giallo, or indeed of Malignant, is realised in the film's moments of extreme violence, when the operatic performance and brutality is stretched and extended into abstraction. Violence is not so much violence in Giallo as it is an aesthetic imperative. Through Giallo, and indeed through the Giallo-inspired filmmaking that has made up a significant facet of slasher cinema, violence is as much an aesthetic, a filmmaking technique even, as lighting, mise-en-scene or cinematography. In the original first draft of this script, I spent about 400 words comparing Giallo to the torture porn genre and how it uses its own renditions of violence as a form of cinematic spectacle. But after getting some feedback from my editor, I realised that though I stand by the assertion of violence being its own form of spectacle, especially when considering how truly buckwild the Saw franchise gets in its later entries, the violence that we associate with the torture porn genre is always somewhat grounded, however non-realistic it is, with a universal acknowledgement of the pain and subjugation it inflicts on its victims. Which actually makes torture porn a really interesting counter to Giallo, and indeed to Malignant. And this is is only emphasised by the fact that James Wan found his horror career by creating the first Saw in 2004. I think it can be argued that the original Saw plays out like a drama, emphasising an on-screen interrogation of physicality in brutally intimate terms, and the individual experiences of its victims at a kind of slowed, excruciating pace. It's a spectacle insofar that it shows ruptured bodies and pain as very real things that can be experienced, and this is only emphasised with a grainy, muted colour palette and a steady-handed filming and editing style for the majority of the film. Malignant, on the other hand, is anything but intimate, and its rendition of spectacle is instead performed through its bright colours, its fast pace, its own unique representations of gore and violence as almost operatic performance and brutality, stretched and extended into abstraction, and a soaring body count thanks to its final act that just kicks the most ass. Where Saw makes you flinch and cower, Malignant makes you laugh and gasp. Reviews have even referred to the film as campy, and I can see why. Susan Sontag, author of Notes on Camp, writes in her first note that camp is a certain mode of aestheticism. It is one way of seeing the world as an aesthetic phenomenon. That way, the way of camp, is not in terms of beauty, but in terms of the degree of artifice, of stylization. Thus embedding camp with the concept of art and spectacle since 1964. And why I'm particularly interested in Malignant is because it directly associates itself with the idea of violence and gore being a unique and truly joyful facet of horror spectacle, and a viable extension to the concept of the gothic visual spectacle that was represented in early horror cinema. Which leads me to this essay subject. Today I will be examining how Malignant represents its rendition of body gothic, or the way in which the body is rendered as a mode of violent and gothic visual spectacle. This essay is not only to examine how Malignant utilises the gothic spectacle in the castle vein, but also to examine its representation of body horror, how it may be compared to other representations in the past, and how it unites concepts of contemporary gothic spectacle, body horror, and violent spectacle in tandem.
before we get into the nitty gritty and very gory, I want to first try and connect my case study to the gothic because of course I do. Gothic is first and foremost a spectacle, writes Hogel, as it can only be indicated through certain visual codes of the liminal, something just below or beyond a threshold, rather than being seen head on. Through this statement, Hogel represents a theory that can be considered when analysing the Gothic as an aesthetic imperative, and not necessarily a narrative one exclusively. He specifically cites the Gothic as it is defined by the 1920s German Expressionist movement and its penchant for harsh lighting, rigged angles, surrealistic imagery, and medievalist settings as an example of his theory. Through this essay, I will be referring back to this theory as the gothic spectacle, or the spectacle of cinema as it directly represents gothic narrative tropes and aesthetic imperatives. I'm discussing this first because I believe that Malignant is very deliberately representing a kind of gothic spectacle, but one that has been influenced by a legion of horror that came after the German Expressionist movement in the 20s, and before what we deem as contemporary horror today. So let's talk about those influences. I am William Castle director of the motion picture you're about to see. William Castle, born in New York City in 1914, was a director particularly interested and invested in the premise of horror as being a unique vehicle for cinematic spectacle. As the proud king of gimmicks, Castle would use a myriad of physical and visual gags to enhance his on-screen frights and leave his audience shrieking. He would use plastic skeletons and ghosts in House on Haunted Hill. Illusiono in 13 Ghosts to either intensify or remove the ghost on screen. In The Tingler, he used Percepto, a vibrating device in some theatre chairs which activated with the on screen action. And in his very first horror gimmick picture, Macabre, in 1958, he gave every customer a certificate for a $1,000 life insurance policy in case they should die of fright during the film. The scenery piques our interest, writes Jordan, as it is an astounding first impression of the very spectacle that most likely attracted theatre as to the film in the first place. William Castle was a sort of maverick at the time he was making films, almost the P.T. Barnum of 60s cinema as he said so himself in his memoirs. There was something of the ringleader about him since he would address the audience in adverts for his films, making his name as much a selling point as the content of his movies. His films were these high camp spectacles of horror and drama, often featuring actors like Vincent Price and Joan Crawford in 1964, fresh off of Whatever Happened to Baby Jane, The Danger of suburban gothic Grand Guignol in her own right. Trash aesthetics, popular culture and its audience even cites William Castle as a director particularly involved with the concept of camp, writing that his 1959 film The Tingler stands as a realisation for the spectacular happening cinema conceived by the futurist movement, a system of traumatisation where the spectacle unfolds not only on the screen but also in the room, and concluding that such experiences and spectacles can be far more profound than those available in spectators of more serious cinema. Which perhaps explains why he attracted the fan base that he did. Though William Castle attracted his fair share of criticism from movie producers and studio executives who saw his gimmicks as well, gimmicky, he certainly attracted some admirers within filmmaking. Among his admirers is my biological father and filmmaker John Waters, who wrote, William Castle was my idol. His films made me want to make films. William Castle was God, and would also go on to portray Castle in Ryan Murphy's Feud, introducing the aforementioned Joan Crawford in Castle's 1964 film, Straight Jacket. But importantly for this essay, another of his admirers was American filmmaker Robert Zemeckis, who loved his his film so much that he co-founded Dark Castle Entertainment in 1998, a film studio which was founded with the intention of remaking all of Castle's films for the then contemporary audience. Though they only got two remakes in, House on Haunted Hill in 1999 and 13 Ghosts in 2001, a film that I unironically enjoy very much, before moving on to produce original material and remakes of non-Castle films, the endeavour of Dark Castle signifies just how important William Castle's rendition of spectacle within the horror genre continues to be, especially since I think Malignant seems so heavily inspired by not only William Castle, but the entire Dark Castle output. Dark Castle's cinematic output was almost universally panned at the time of their respective releases, but nowadays the Academy has been able to retroactively appreciate them for what they were able to contribute to cinematic horror at the time. And one of the more significant things that I believe Dark Castle contributed to the horror genre was Wheeler Dixon's concept of horror consistently 
literally one-upping itself from remake to remake. And what better way to one-up the king of cinematic spectacle than to recreate his films through the lens of violent spectacle. Violence. Violence! From the very first scene in Malignant, there is a distinct portrayal of the kind of imagery William Castle, and indeed Dark Castle, was known for. A pan up on a massive haunted building, be that hospital, castle, or haunted house. The frantic fumbling through shadowed hallways that ooze gothic spectacle. Doctors and medical professionals enacting harrowing torture on vulnerable victims, and the image of a screeching monster seen exclusively through haze and silhouette, leaving everything up to the imagination until the last moment. As well as this, the disjointed editing effects, the flashing lights and the distinct attention paid to harsh lighting and rigid angles not only associates Malignant with the earlier discussed German expressionist gothic spectacle, but also replicates an editing style that Dark Castle was famous for. Well, infamous for. Apparently this editing style hasn't aged all too well. Amidst the aesthetic changes that Dark Castle implemented to their adapted films, as well as updating them for a contemporary audience though, I would argue that the attention paid to more explicit depictions of violence was a considerably important one, especially for this essay. About the 1999 House on Haunted Hill remake, Paul Meehan writes, Compared with William Castle's juvenile original, the remake is awash with blood, gore, decapitated heads, heads, pickled anatomical specimens, and all manner of ghoulish nastiness, thus associating Dark Castle's output as being substantially more invested in violent spectacle amidst the gothic spectacle innate to their placement as Castle remakes. Similarly, where Castle's original 13 Ghosts is retroactively a little gauche and campy, Dark Castle's 2001 remake amps up the scares dramatically. It presents us with some truly bombastic gore, body horror, and special effects that have since been celebrated and applauded as some of the best practical effects of the time, almost entirely removed from their original source material. To return back to the previous theory about Giallo, I would argue that Dark Castle does the same thing. By situating its film's violence as sort of set pieces or an operatic performance stretched and extended into abstraction, Ben Moss being cut in half in 13 Ghosts, Jeffrey Combs in the introductory medical scenes in House on Haunted Hill. These are, of course, violent scenes, but they're also very heightened outrageously outlandish and, for lack of a better word, incredibly campy. And I think Malignant is doing the exact same thing by replicating this truly outlandish rendition of violence through a lens of inarguable camp. Also unrelated, but while Jeffrey Rush is generally credited as performing an homage to Vincent Price in the House on Haunted Hill remake, he also stated that he was paying homage to John Waters too, which I think implies all you need to know about how camp Dark Castle is. And though it's not a William Castle original, I think I would be remiss not to mention the 2005 House of Wax remake, another film I unironically really enjoy for a multitude of reasons, and another Dark Castle picture that was universal panned upon its release. The reason I bring up House of Wax is because not only is it another significant representation of Dark Castle's newfound attention on violently spectacular set pieces in their films, but also because of its explicit depiction of the very gothic horrors of transformation, deformity, and body horror and conjoined twins. Now, I spoke a little about the significance of body horror in my reanimator essay last year, so to briefly sum up, body horror is and has been a long pervading subgenre of horror, with depictions of body horror present in the works of canonical writers like Mary Shelley, Edgar Allan Poe, and H.B. Lovecraft. Before cinema, body horror was used extensively by the Grand Guignol Theatre, which introduced the concept of naturalism into horror, an unmasked brutality of contemporary culture, where previous horror served as escapism, dealing with the supernatural and unrelatable, the Grand Guignol introduced relatable topics into the genre, fears of revenge, insanity, and brutal sadism. This isn't to imply that the Grand Guignol was grounded in any sort of theatrical naturalism, though, because it certainly wasn't that. Le laboratoire des hallucinations. Where a doctor finds his wife's lover in his operating room and performs a graphic brain surgery on stage, is more reanimator than actual medical realism. And... Le baiser dans la nuit where a young woman visits the man whose face she horribly disfigured with acid is entirely removed from any kind of realistic approach to horror. The Grand Guignol, in its own way, represents its own rendition of camp, one that's entirely embedded in the artifice and spectacle that is unique to the horror genre. And I would argue that Malignant does a similar thing. 
but more on that later. This isn't to say that traditional Gothic literature was entirely without violence. For example, The Monk, which evoked a number of controversies and book burnings at the time, depicts the trampling of a nun, the rotting corpse of a baby, and in its final scene, the bruising and mangling of its main character. Malmoth the Wanderer includes a scene of explicit cannibalism between two lovers locked in an underground passage, and the ending of The Facts in the Case of M. Valdemar by Edgar Allan Poe depicts a man shrinking and crumbling into a near-liquid mess of loathsome, of detestable putrescence. Indeed, the Gothic persists in representing a range of bloody rituals, gruesome tortures, ghastly punishments, and spectacular immolations. These explicit depictions of violence amidst the canonical works of the Gothic would later inspire works described as splatterpunk, a literary movement much like torture porn in cinema dedicated to depicting gore and gruesome violence, though some were certainly more gothically inclined than others. Returning back to body horror in cinema though, post-1980 there seemed to be a significant shift in the horror genre towards body horror, spearheaded by directors such as David Cronenberg, Clive Barker, Frank Henenlotter, Stuart Gordon and Brian Neusner, all of whom depicted their own renditions of body horror in new and extremely visceral ways. Frank Henenlotter is a particularly relevant book body horror director for this case study though, especially through his works Basket Case and Brain Damage. In Basket Case, Dwayne Bradley, normal guy extraordinaire, seeks vengeance for the unwanted surgery that separated him from his deformed, once conjoined twin brother who he hides in a basket. And in Brain Damage, normal guy Brian becomes infected with a parasite at the back of his head that promises him a life without worry so long as he allows the parasite to kill people at random and devour their brains. While both of these films focus predominantly Prominently on the comedic aspects of body horror, and subsequently the inherent comedy of male vulnerability in body horror films, but that's another essay. Malignant plays both of these plot lines relatively straight, despite how truly bonkers the final act is. Where Basket Case's comedy plays with the idea of a living tumour, a bastardised conjoined twin being resentful of his separation from the body, that is Malignant's driving plot point. Upon the reveal. <laughs> <laughs> My leg, that's so insane. It's so good. <laughs> you just, you ever like just think that malignant was a thing that got made? I think every day it got made. Oh, okay. Upon the reveal that Malignant's killer, Gabriel, is not in fact a typical slasher, demon, or... <laughs> I can't stop laughing. <laughs> I can't stop laughing. This is so silly is not in fact a typical slasher, demon, or imaginary friend as we first thought, but Madison's conjoined twin brother. <laughs> we learn that Madison's prophetic visions are Gabriel hunting down the doctors that separated him from Madison and exacting bloody brutal revenge on the people that denied him a proper life. And can we please all just say thank you James Wan for this twist? Like, I thought this was going to be a Conjuring-esque demon movie, but when that VHS tape started, I was literally shaking with how excited I was. Malignant is so good, dude. My god. <laughs> Xavier Reyes writes extensively about the connection between gothic spectacle and body horror in his book, Body Gothic, Corporal Transgression in Contemporary Literature and Horror Film, which I consulted heavily with while writing this essay. And one of the key monikers of body gothic that Reyes identifies is a concept of transformation and deformity. He writes, the gothic often relies on the grotesque, and in reference to the H.G. Wells gothic classic, The Island of Dr. Moreau, the monstrous nature of their anatomies, the fact they are eminently high hybrid and therefore resistant to clear-cut categorization is deeply disturbing and causes mistrust or hatred. Historically, the representation of deformity within the horror genre has either worked or it hasn't. For example, though the release of The Phantom of the Opera in 1929, which exhibited the deformed phantom, effectively saved Universal Pictures from dissolving in the 30s, the subsequent release of Freaks in 1932 basically ruined director Todd Browning's career. Of course, the difference between the two pictures 
captures is clear. The Phantom is the villain, if a retroactively sympathetic one, where the titular freaks are arguably the heroes, and audiences struggle to extend empathy to the marginalised bodies, both in text and behind the scenes, represented in freaks. We are more inclined to sympathise with the deformed hero these days though, which means that both brain damage and malignant can represent the deformed hero and the deformed villain without anyone ruining their careers. Hopefully. Brain damage in particular associates itself with the fear of transformation, or the Jackal Hyde subsection of body horror texts, in which normality and monster are two aspects of the same person, and Jackal, the normative, has desires that only Hyde, the monster, can act on. It is the contrast between the two characters that gives you a better sense of who they are and how they are used through the text. Brian is normative, the Alma is monster, which also explains some of the homoerotic imagery in this text too. In a similar vein, Madison and Gabriel are almost explicitly Jackal and Hyde through their own narratives, with Gabriel as Hyde able to enact revenge on Madison's abusers, though this could be interpreted as brotherly protectiveness, do actions that she denies herself and speak thoughts that she is repressed within. In that way, Malignant depicts an explicit return of the repressed narrative, a theory presented by Robin Wood. Wood argues that the repressed represented the surplus that existed in society, but had not been allowed to exist openly, left lingering under one's bed or hidden in the closet. And because of his thorough examination of Jackal and Hyde, and how it too was a representation of the inward return of the repressed, one can certainly argue that what we repress in ourselves has the opportunity to return as well. Indeed, the repressed will inevitably return to represent itself. Countering this take though, Gabriel also won't allow Madison to change. He is in some way trying to maintain some stasis by taking away her bodily autonomy, perhaps epitomising why someone cannot be solely defined by their oppressed rage or resentment without effectively destroying themselves and those around them. Basket case and brain damage both explicitly represent the gothic fear of deformity and transformation, and Malignant continues that representation into the space of contemporary horror, while also throwing a bit of medical horror in too, connecting it with the medically inclined body horror that continues to be a long-standing trope of the body horror subgenre. The concept of deformation is extended even further in another of Ray's cited text, The Beetle, about which he writes, One of the main concerns for Esquire Sidney in The Beetle is the impossibility of gendering the creature. After seeing it naked, he realises that it possesses female genitals but a manly demeanour, articulating a kind of intergender horror within the text. And this bit of theory is especially exciting for me because because of course it is. Gabriel is not only a representation of Jackal and Hyde's transformation and medical deformity, typical monikers of the body gothic, but also one of intergender horror. Though he shares Madison's body and is presented as androgynous, with long hair and a short skinny stature, he is distinctly masculinized within the narrative, speaks via speakerphone with a deep voice, and exhibits a sort of manly demeanour, thus emphasising the distance between that which is recognisable and therefore nameable, Madison, and the othered unspeakable body, Gabriel. Though I do have to add, Madison and Gabriel are technically conjoined twins, and conjoined twins only happen in the case of identical twins that have to be the same sex. So... Inclusivity win, malignant slash a villain is trans, I guess. It's also interesting to consider Gabriel's presentation by returning back to the earlier discussion of camp. Medhurst defines camp as undermining the heterosexual normativity through enacting outrageous inversions of aesthetic and gender codes. And, well, the intergender Gabriel literally destroys the heterosexual family unit by eating his sister's babies, killing her husband, dressing in drag, and looking like he's the lost member of Slipknot. I don't think we could get a more outrageous inversion of gender's aesthetic if we tried. She's got a point, she's an icon, she's a legend, and she is the moment. Now come on now. Now I'm not trying to say that Malignant deliberately tried to replicate some old transphobic gothic story through Gabriel's intergender presentation, but you can't deny that it's pretty interesting to connect the two stories together. I think what Malignant was trying to do instead was represent a more traditional slasher and final girl dynamic through Gabriel and Madison. After all, most slashers and final girls have relationships of some kind, and some are sibling relationships. 
For example, Halloween's Laurie Strode and Michael Myers are often read as siblings, and the iconic reveal of Roman Bridges as Sidney's brother in Scream 3 is one that basically retconned the entire series and everyone hated. That last fight scene was incredible though. And what's a more extreme relationship than the slasher being your literal conjoined twin? Additionally, I think we can identify that Malignant was also representing a sort of oppressive and toxic relationship between the two siblings that we traditionally associate with men and women in horror. Where Gabriel removed one abusive man in Madison's life through the killing of her abusive husband, he replaced it with himself, taking full ownership and control over her body and even eating her babies in utero to keep himself alive. There's also some very deliberate biblical referencing in Malignant. While Madison refers to Gabriel as the devil, his name is a very clear reference to the often non-gendered Archangel Gabriel, who visited the Virgin Mary to announce she would be the mother of Jesus Christ. This is an interesting counter to Malignant's Gabriel, who takes motherhood away from Madison, denying her the opportunity to move and grow past her trauma and into a new life. I think what Malignant does very well, amidst the bombastic gore and spectacle, is pose a very interesting examination of trauma, and I do think that that is done partially through the gendering of Gabriel as male. Where Gabriel is angry and resentful of those who cut out the cancer, removed him from Madison's life, and extends his anger to Madison's adopted mother and sister, Sydney, Madison wants and is able to literally forget her trauma, and by extension her brother, in the pursuit of a happier life. Gabriel's anger towards Madison is because of her desire to forget him, her own flesh and blood, to try and replace him with her sister, her potential children. And much like a man with too much control over a woman's body, he violently rejects her attempts at happiness. However, and to reiterate some theory from my Leslie Vernon essay, Carol J. Clover argues that slasher films present us in startlingly direct terms with a world in which male and female are at desperate odds, but in which, at the same time, masculine masculinity and femininity are more states of mind than body, meaning that male slashers can often be viewed as just as androgynous as their female survivors and vice versa. Gabriel literally inhabits a female body, and it is Madison's final capacity to merge with Gabriel, to embody his masculine qualities, that gives her the strength to save her sister from his rampage and herself from his control. In literature, the term gothic double refers to a polar duality of good and evil within a single character defined by a shift in gothic literature where evil was no longer situated within a physical location, such as a dark castle, but expanded to inhabit the mind of characters, often referred to as the haunted individual. Malignant replicates this concept of the polar duality of good and evil, but instead turns the concept on its head by making those dualities two different people in the same body, the literal haunted individual. To expand on this further, it's interesting to consider that Gabriel literally comes from Madison's head, when the gothic is largely defined by women being afraid that they are going mad. This is even replicated within Malignant when Madison says, It's all in my head. It's all in my head. Because it literally is in her head. Oh my god, this movie! Hey, I'm editing at the moment, but I just wanted to point out that there are several instances that foreshadow this twist. One is whenever Madison wakes up, her head is bloody because her skull has been opened to let Gabriel out, so to speak. Two, as Gabriel gains more control of the body, Madison's wardrobe changes from white to grey to the full black ensemble that is associated with Gabriel. And three, the music motif that scores the film is actually a riff on the Pixies Where Is My Mind, a film also commonly associated with David Fincher's Fight Club. Another film about the hero and the quote unquote villain being the same person. And once you realise that Gabriel is on the back of Madison's head, his contortions are a lot more obvious and visible. For some reason I didn't even notice that his body was moving so weirdly on my first watch. And what's even better is that this was all done practically, with very little CGI. To return back to God 
gothic doubling. In a way, Malignant therefore replicates what Daphrin writes as the romantic double, citing Kathy Earnshaw and Heathcliff as examples in which one person is good, capable of evil, and the other is evil, capable of good. The romantic double, as represented through the gothic, are intrinsically connected to each other in a unity of damning love, be that explicitly romantic, platonic, or a sibling relationship. And love, as depicted through the gothic, is equated to the strongest emotion which the mind is capable of feeling, as capable of evoking sublime terror and obscurity as any horror can. Because it is not violence, force, or destruction that ultimately defeats Gabriel, but love. After mowing through a plethora of people, police officers and bystanders, Gabriel eventually infiltrates the hospital where his and Madison's birth mother is being treated. He expresses resentment towards her, anger that she gave them up without loving them, and anger towards Madison's sister that once again asserting his masculine demeanour and trauma response. It is then that their mother tearfully tells him, I should never have given you away. You were my son. And I should have loved you no matter what. And this is enough to make him hesitate. Long enough for Madison to gain control over their body again, awakened by her love for her sister and her lost children, and trap him inside of their head, where she will be ready for him if he ever awakens again. To quote the Tumblr post I made hours after first seeing the film, Gabriel was abandoned by his mother, forgotten by his sister, and demonised by literally every character in the movie. Had he, for even a moment, experienced an ounce of love, empathy or compassion, he might not have been a monstrous creature motivated entirely by anger and hatred. Yes, my ability to sympathise with men in any situation extends to a tumour on the back of a woman's head. Thank you for asking. I love terrible men. It's my only character trait and I will not apologise for it. I wish you would! I <laughs> I wish you would. Editing me again. Hi. This is also a sentiment seemingly reiterated by the crew behind Malignant, specifically by its costume designer, Lisa Norcia, who refers to Gabriel as an anti-hero. She notes that the draw of Gabriel from horror fans is rooted in something very personal, because he was the unwanted child. As Malignant's opening scene makes clear, Gabriel is seen as a cancer, something to be destroyed, gotten rid of. Sure, his actions might make him a mean, vicious person, but all he ever really wanted was to be loved by his mother and to be alive. And as Nausea notes, audiences, especially horror buffs, tend to root for the underdogs. And of course, it helps when said underdog can pull off parkour moves in a floor-length leather coat. His mother extending love and compassion to him, effectively healing the wound that he had long suffered from and actively contributed to through his plight for revenge, is what stops the slasher villain in his tracks, and what allows his final girl to take over and save her sister and birth mother, thus representing a unification of three generations of women. And it is also also through the final merging with Gabriel, being able to remember and not repress her traumas and embody his righteous anger, that Madison's relationship with Sydney and potentially her birth mother is ultimately strengthened. So, to conclude, Malignant is the only movie that exists, the only movie that matters. This is now a Malignant fan channel. Throughout its runtime, Malignant represents its own brutal, bloody and bombastic rendition of body gothic, associating it with a long-running history of gothic spectacle, body horror and violent spectacle that has been embedded in the horror genre since its very conception. Not only this, it operates as a true example of just how important audience engagement is from a horror production perspective, and serves as a real love letter to the people who unabashedly enjoy horror, be that trash, slasher, or giallo, for all its bizarre, gory glory. And I, for one, am very excited to hear about the upcoming sequels, are uh, Gabriel Takes Manhattan, Gabriel in Space, and oh yeah, Gabriel Tokyo Drift. Or whatever they do with this IP, please, James Wan will take anything. Malignant sleep. The only movie to sell one Malignant ticket. Malignant 1000 years! <laughs> 
Hello video nasties, thank you for watching this video essay. I've been dying to talk about Malignant since it came out, and some chats with other academics, especially Simon Brown with Kingston University, really put me on the right track for the inspiration for this essay, so hopefully I'll stop thinking about Malignant so much now. No promises though. I've been quiet lately, but I've spent the summer talking at a few virtual conferences if you managed to catch those. But if not, no fear, I have plans to turn those papers into their own videos, so we have plans. We have plans. Be sure to check out my Twitter if you want to see some horror hot takes and streams of consciousness. And if you want to support me further, you can check out my Patreon where I post access to my scripts, early access to videos, and if you want to join my patron crew who are cool and very wise. Until the next one video nasties, stay safe and remember to always stay spooky.